Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Reflect Forward. I'm your host, Carrie Siggins. I'm so excited to have my first interview of the year, and it is such a good one. I had the pleasure of interviewing Sean Mangenis, who is the president of CEO Coaching International. It's a coaching firm that I use. Prior to that, he was the COO and president at YPO. And I've talked about YPO, Young Presidents Organization, extensively on this show, and and I love it. It's a peer-to-peer -peer learning space that uh, provides, oh my gosh, so much value. I just can't even imagine my life without YPO. And I also can't even imagine my life without CEO Coaching International and my coach, Chris Larkins. And I'm so excited that Sean is part of the team. And in this interview, Sean will share what it was like to lead YPO and why he's such a believer in peer-to-peer -peer learning spaces and why every executive should be part of one and why every executive should have a coach of some sort. We talk about the Make Big Happen system that CEO Coaching International puts their clients through to help them scale their business to really make a big impact in the world. And he shares all kinds of insight on what being a leader means to him. And it's a great interview and I know you're going to love it. It's such a great way to kick off the new year. So with that, hang tight. I'll be right back with Sean. All right, I'm back everybody. Sean, thank you so much for joining the show. I'm so excited about this interview. Thank you, Kerry. It's wonderful to be here with you. Fantastic. All right. So uh, I first met you at a CEO Coaching International event. And at the time, you were president and CEO of YPO. And my listeners know all about YPO because I talk about it often. And I am so curious, yep. what was it like to run YPO? And why do you believe in organizations like YPO so much? Great question, Kerry. And you know, one, it was an extraordinary privilege. It's a 70 year old organization and comprised of what now about 33,000 plus CEOs. And I think for me, the great, one of the, one of the greatest learnings is the diversity of leadership, talent and experience and what people are doing in the world in all different countries. And so when you see that diversity and you realize that you're an integral part of a very connected world and leadership is not that different in China than it is in South Africa, where I, I'm from, or the United States or the UK, because we are all struggling in essence with our own leadership abilities. And then, you know, the difficulties of running a business and growing a business and keeping it profitable and recruiting people and making an impact in the world. So every day I'd go to work and I would learn, I was just on this learning curve for close to eight years that just didn't stop. I feel in many ways that I'm still on that learning curve. And what I realized personally was just how important it is to be open, to learn from very gifted and very different people, men, women. Um, YPO has this amazing young next generation group and the kids coming up are extraordinary. So that in a nutshell was, it was amazing. And then having the opportunity to solve some tricky problems, as we know, we've gone through this shocking two year period with COVID, you know, we're going through another big surge of a new variant and leading YPO through crisis management. We had to cancel a whole series of very expensive events and put our teams into a whole different mindset and really protect the organization and then prepare it for the future. So, you know, when we, at the end, when we look at your, this podcast reflect forward is how do you develop the skills to prepare for what you don't know is going to happen? And that's the beauty of a journey like that. So huge, huge growth in, in that experience. Yeah. And I'm sure it, there were lots of challenges. I mean, I can only imagine what it's like, like to try to herd 30,000 CEOs. <laughs> so. Well, you know, people do, people say that. And the reality is most YPOs, in fact, I would say when, when a person joins YPO and they get into their forum, it very quickly becomes not about them and it becomes about their journey of discovery, whatever that may be to them. And I have found that 
even the most difficult conversations and some of the most difficult personalities, when you start from the perspective of trying to meet somebody where they're at, and YPO has this brilliant framework within their forum construct, which I know you know about, where you suspend judgment and you literally kind of take the ego out. And that's one of the big lessons in leadership is really being clear on who you're serving. And so a lot of YPOers get involved in volunteer work. You know, fully 3,500 members every year volunteer in some way to run the, the YPO business. So even though I was responsible for two thirds of the PL and running a global team and all of that good stuff, we could not have done it without the volunteer efforts of the member leaders. And so you quickly realize that in order to harness the differences and deal with what may be to you is a difficult set of behaviors, when you, when you frame it for yourself that you're in service to, and you meet the person where they're at, there wasn't a problem. There maybe were one or two where it was almost impossible to have a breakthrough. But if you operate in that way, I have found there's always an opportunity for resolution or breakthrough and a real opportunity to collaborate effectively. I, and I've lived that. I've, I've literally many countless experiences where if you had asked me going into them, does this have any opportunities to succeed? I would have handicapped it very negatively, uh, but operating out of that perspective, bringing it down to, okay, let me listen. Let me attempt to understand where you're coming from. And even though I may have an overriding agenda to get a particular result by doing that first, I was able to deal with most circumstances. You do get yeah. bad actors though, and that's in every walk of life. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And, and the collaboration piece is what I, one of the things that I enjoy most about, about uh, YPO. I've been learning officer for the Doing Business Globally Network, just moving into the chair for the 2022-23 learning year. And, uh, and it's just amazing to watch that collaboration and all of the volunteer hours that people put in. I mean, I put in hundreds and hundreds of hours of just trying to create hundreds of hours. content for my, my fellow YPOers, uh, trying to give them opportunity to learn new things or meet people that they wouldn't have met. And it's a lot of work. And I don't think everybody knows exactly what happens behind the scene and just how much work goes into uh, making YPO successful, not just from YPO management, but also from, you know, the peer to peer experience. From the peer to peer. And I started like you, you know, I spent seven and a half years as a member before I joined the management team volunteering. And what, what that gave me was the ability to lead other leaders. That's yeah. a phrase that is often used and you've done a great job with that. And it's being able to literally put yourself at service. Whereas most people join these community groups, they join as users and not users in the negative sense, but you know, they're, they're utilizing the products, the services, the events, and they, they're receiving a lot. YPO has flipped that. And it's, it's the only organization I think of its kind. EO is very similar because they, and they both have that nonprofit underpinning where both those organizations rely on members. And the unique differences and skill sets of the members to really drive the mission and the vision and the sustainability. I think, you know, you know, YPO has a retention rate of over 96%, even during COVID, which I wasn't surprised at. There were, there were certain circles and we had a lot of discussion at the board level about, should we prepare ourselves for the reality of a massive downturn and a lot of attrition? And we did, you know, we took the conservative approach, which you want to do with members money. But at the end of the day, it turned out to be a, I won't say a bad decision, but it turned out to be a false premise because yeah. the thesis was, well, everybody's in panic mode. These, a lot of businesses are going to go out of business. They're going to struggle. Yes. But when that happens, what do people need? Connection, right? support. They need yes. mentors. They need yeah. each other. They need peers. They need motivation. They need calm in the storm. And so... And we actually saw a slight bump. I think we hit 96.5 and my previous seven years helping with the membership, which was in my responsibility. And by the way, when I talk about me, I'm talking collectively, it sh I should say we, because YPO and everything we deliver is a team effort between members and their leadership, the management team. But we were able to do that for eight years in a row at over 96%. There are not a lot of businesses that can, that have that degree of stickiness uh, yeah. and is, they're doing something right. Yeah, no, I agree. 
And you have this really unique insider view and outsider view being a YPO member yes. and then coming on and running it. So why are these peer-to-peer -peer winning spaces so important? For me, it started because I had had no, when I joined EO back in 1992 or 1993, I had never volunteered for anything, but I was seeking something. I, I was a young entrepreneur. I was making it up as I went along. It was the same goes building the plane as it's in flight. I had nobody that I could be vulnerable with. And I think that's the case for a lot of leaders, the first time entrepreneurs, first time CEOs. We all have this, it's called the imposter syndrome in many instances, but what I love about the peer to peer space is you're in the same boat. And if you're prepared to be vulnerable and authentic and truthful in sharing what your concerns are and what keeps you up at night and where you think your weaknesses are and vulnerabilities, it's amazing what comes back to you. My first experience, and I don't know if you experienced this, Kerry, but in forum, when, when I was sharing a, a very difficult time in, in my business and I had a partner that we were at odds, I was a young person, and I didn't know how to deal with it. I had, I had advisors. You could go to an attorney. You could go to, I could go to my dad to talk things through, but I was the ultimate responsible. I was the one that had to make a decision, which could impact my employees, could impact my own well-being, my families, and nobody can be in that seat with you. But when you, when you share the experience, it's amazing how many similarities and similar experiences peers have. Many different businesses, different stages of their life cycle and their business life cycle. But even if you had one or two from a peer group that have been through what you're going through, having that perspective given to you, remarkable, absolutely remarkable, because it gives you hope and it gives you perspective that you can find a solution that's going to work out. And I found that I, I was so fortunate and I saw that in other people, you know, I saw some some really tough lessons that fellow entrepreneurs and business leaders were going through that I would never want to go through myself, but going through it with them, literally, you know, they have that saying in the forum, you go through the mud, the blood and the flood, and you see that. And when people come out of it stronger, more resilient, more cognizant of why they got into the situation they got into. And then the celebration or the commiseration, that sort of, I, I would call it kind of group hug that happens. If I could be real honest with you and vulnerable, the relationships that you build really are, are very loving relationships because when you go through and you experience that, and these are complete strangers, remember when you first meet them, um, and you suddenly realize, boy, you know, I'm not alone in this. It is a very difficult journey. Life is messy for all of us. And how do we get through it? Because we are going to go through stuff that we don't even know you and I are going to come our way. It could right. happen tomorrow. It could happen two years from now. It may not be business. It may be health. It may be in somebody's life that we deeply care for and love. It may be in our communities. It may be in our country. It may be on the planet. Um, and how do we as people deal with that? And that's the beauty of the peer group where you have this almost like this backup team. I, I, you know, it's, it, it's sometimes difficult to describe because it's such a emotional, deeply rooted in experience, experience, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I agree completely uh, with everything that you said. And I've had similar form experiences. And I think the, the thing that I really liked about YPO, like YPO was the last thing I was going to cut on my budget if I had to in 2020, yes. uh, because to me, it was also, I also am so inspired, right? I've always been able to look at people and go, okay, you know, they're playing it big. I can play it bigger. I can do this. <laughs> Whereas maybe yes. I have some self doubt or, you know, Ugh, it's going to be too hard or I don't have the team to do it or whatever it is. And then you watch other people doing it and really creating value for their customers and scaling their companies. And it's been really inspiring for me to, you know, to change my mindset and stop playing it small and really go for it. And so that's one of the other benefits that I have, I've gotten from it. I love that. And I've had a similar experience and I'm just, I feel in many ways at 57 that I'm just getting going. I feel like a kid in a candy store almost every day. 
because you you see these examples and you see these amazing people. I'm in a white or gold forum, you know, a 50 plus forum. I'm the second youngest in the group of 10. And the next old, oldest to me is 10 years older. So I'm, I'm watching people in the latest stages of their careers and lives who are up to something big every single day. Some are doing it in philanthropy. Some are still starting businesses. Some are making different, uh, you know, major impacts in investing in research and moonshots and earth shots. And I look at that and I go, oh my gosh, I'm still a piker. <laughs> you know, I'm still a junior on this journey. <laughs> Very motivational, isn't it? It really is. It's proven, right? The yes. people who you surround yourself with, you tend to be more like them, think more like them, have more of the same financial situation and and success and, and mindset. And so when you surround yourself with, you know, 30,000, you know, potentially 30,000 people who are doing really big things and love growing businesses and scaling and, and giving back and making an impact, you can't help but raise your game because you oh. get that, that, that contagious energy. <laughs> You do, you know, and, and even the resources, you know, I've met, I've met amazing academics, whether it's from the top universities in the world or some members that are just highly intellectually brilliant. I mean, yeah. you know, Mensa, PhD, smart, and you sit in these rooms and you go, you just kind of, there are times where you, I have to take a deep breath and go, okay, that's all right. You play in your lane. It's just fine. But you recognize just how miraculously beautiful, you know, the world is, people's capability are, you know, and then, you know, if you place yourself in that journey, I don't think there are limits. We, and, you know, many people have said the only limits we have are those we place on ourselves. And I'm a firm believer in that because, you know, leaders are not made in mind. You can learn, you can change your behaviors, you can adapt. But if you're not surrounded by people that have that mindset, it's even more difficult to really accomplish the things you set out to do. And a lot of people go through life with any, without any goals, without any, okay, what's next for me? And that's why I love YPO. Joining before you're 45, I think is an essential differentiating ingredient in their model. Because what you're doing is you're getting all these, you're stimulating young people to come in and the older people are learning from the young, the younger are learning from the old and everything in between. It's a great melting pot. It really is. I love it. And I'm sure it has set you up for success in your new role as yeah. president of CEO Coaching International. So congratulations on that. Thank uh, you very I'm much. I'm so excited that you're part of the, the team. So tell us uh, a little bit about CEO Coaching International. Chris has been on the show before, but um, uh, a long time ago. So I think it'd be good to give everybody a refresher and tell us about your plans. How are you, how are you there to help the organization grow? Yeah, fantastic. So Mark Moses, uh, extraordinary individual. I, I, I met Mark 25 years ago, watched him on his entrepreneurial journey and watched him go from, you know, really a, a very successful CEO, a billion dollar business to being a coach, a CEO to CEO coach, and then attracting other successful coaches who'd had these exits uh, and then building a framework and a model that I think is really, is very unique, the Make Big Happen system, it's called. But essentially, you know, I think it boils down to, the whole system boils down to really helping the CEOs understand not only the context of their business and the letters in their business, but beginning with themselves. So many CEOs, and this is where YPO and EO don't go, because they're very good at the peer-to-peer, -peer, but where is their accountability partner? Where is their true, you know, mentor, that individual who's been there and done that, that they can interact with in a very private, very confidential way to take them through that journey and through those different arcs of reinvention as they build their business. And it starts with that see, understanding there's those four basic parameters, right? What does the CEO want? What do they want for themselves? What do they want for their business? What do they need in order to get them to where they're going? And a lot of people don't think about that because we get stuck in the day-to-day. -day. We get stuck in the already way of doing things or the existing way of doing things. So it's helping them understand what can get in the way, what the blind spots are, and then who's going to hold you ultimately accountable 
your shareholders, yes, your employees, yes, but at the personal level, when you're, you know, in those those moments of deep personal introspection, where the seeds of doubt come in and these, you know, that little voice in the back of your on your shoulders is, is, you know, we call it talking garbage or filling your head with with rubbish, right? Um, who's gonna who's gonna help you not to do the work and to make the decisions, but to be your accountability partner. So that's that's how the business got started. It's evolved beautifully since then. We're up over 43 coaches now. We've got a new cohort starting. We've got over 430 clients. Our goal and my mission and and uh, task from Mark and our board is to really help us be the McKinsey, the Bain of the CEO coaching world. If we can impact 2,500 CEOs and their executive teams in the next five years, build up a cadre of the world's best coaches and provide them the care, the nurturing, the competence to really stand out as a true accountability partner, then I think we would have hit our noble purpose. And that purpose is to really help each individual CEO deliver the best value for themselves, their stakeholders, their businesses, for whatever their ultimate goal is going to be. I experienced that, that exact same thing. I mean, I found, uh, I found Mark uh, and Chris on YPO. I sent out a uh, a message on the leadership development network, again, the peer to peer thing saying, I want a coach like Tim Grover, right? Like he's the one who yes. took Michael Jordan to great, to his greatness. I want that. And so <laughs> Mark and Chris were like, Hey, we think we're the guys for you. And, you know, they've been able to help me do exactly what you just said. And it's so great. important. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I'm talking to a lot of clients like you, Kerry, and this is what I hear consistently. And, you know, it's not that you need a coach forever, right? It may be two years. It may be three years. You may use a coach for a year. You may come back to it in two years. It's recognizing at a given point in time that having somebody to be there with you in that journey who has the perspective, the skill, and you may need different things going forward. You may need somebody with the ability to help you sell your company one day. That's very different than somebody who can help you scale and grow your business. So we provide that entire arc through the, literally the business life cycle. If you think of the Adesas model of the business life cycle, when do you need that help? And when don't you have the, the, the right people in place to get you there? Having that coach is, is vital in my, in my experience, actually. And so do you think that every CEO, every executive leader should have a coach? You know, if you ask any of the top CEOs, I would say that they would say, yes, I've had a coach, I, my first coach was Dan Sullivan. I was a, um, you know, he had a business called the strategic coach in Toronto, Canada. I think maybe I was in the first 50 clients he ever had. Yeah. And I was in his program for, I think three years. Then I had a, a, a wonderful coach, um, based out of Vancouver for about five years. And then, you know, I've had, I've had several others. I went through a whole program to help me called the landmark forum at one point in my career, just to get clear on. I, I would, I would focus a lot on past things and I'd get angry about what, what happened yesterday. And there's nothing you can do about yesterday, right? I mean, yesterday, the past gives you perspective and it gives you opportunity to learn from mistakes, but being trapped in the past and trying to live out of that is a recipe for disaster. So I think every CEO, every business leader needs an accountability partner, whether you can get that internally. Or externally, I think it's vital. And I would advocate it for every single person serious about leading because leadership is difficult. Leadership yeah. is hard work, as you and I know. Yeah, absolutely. I know I have coaches for all of my executive team and for lots of individual contributors within the organization, uh, high potential people or people who are worth investing in. I'm such a believer in, in coaching. And it all comes from my first coaching experience, which was more of a life coach than a business coach. Yes. Uh, but it was very in early in my career at Stone Age. I had just become a CEO. And my biggest issue was, well, I had substance abuse issues and, and really trying to like understand where all of that came from and yes. the damage that it caused in my life. And I had let all that go, but I had to forgive myself, heal and really forgive myself so that I didn't let it hold me back. And so I hired a life coach and she changed my life. I mean, she helped me understand my triggers and why I did the things that I did. And 
it translated so much into leadership and, and she works with many people on my team still. And that was exactly what I needed. And it, it made coaching accessible and it was so impactful that I've, I've never not had a coach, even though I've had a couple of different ones since her, but it was a yes. life changing experience. I wouldn't be where I am today without her. Yeah. It sounds like we've had a similar journey. Yeah. So I can see why you're so excited to take on this role and, and really help other executives make those life changing uh, choices. It's like a dream life. job. I mean, yeah. I couldn't design a better job for myself. So I'm just blessed. You know, I look at it. Gratitude is such, I put a post on LinkedIn this week about gratitude and what I find with, um, with a lot of leaders is they, a lot of leaders often forget to just step back and take stock and really think from the perspective of, wow, how did I, you know, look at you, look at what you've accomplished, Kerry, in your business, in your life, with your family, you know, there's a tremendous amount to be grateful for there. I mean, the fact that we're having this conversation, the fact that we have the opportunities we both have, that in and of itself, the fact that I live in the United States of America, which people are so prone to criticize and there's so much polarity, but if they just took that little sliver of service away, they looked beneath and they said, what do we have? We have the best country on the planet in my view. And I can say that as a proud immigrant and I don't want to get political. If you operate out of gratitude, it reframes the conversation. And I think leaders who truly understand their roles, you know, I have sort of four basic tenets of leadership. You know, one is know yourself. You know, for me, it took me, a, it took me a while through my early twenties and thirties and men, you know, we, we mature at a much slower rate than you guys do, <laughs> but knowing yourself, what are your strengths and weaknesses? You know, what, what to. What to you will enable you to be yourself? You know, I think a lot of people go through their early leadership pretending to be somebody they're not because they model on something that they think is the right way to do it. But if you can anchor in knowing yourself and then truly understand your strengths and weaknesses, surround yourself with people that bolster you and then, you know, try to get better. I think that's a, that's a critical component. And if any of your listeners are newly created CEOs or young aspiring leaders or entrepreneurs, do yourself a favor and, you know, go through and do things like DISC and Berkman and TTI and other Clifton strengths and all these great, there's some amazing self-discovery tools out there that just give you a little bit of a third party insight, feedback, 360s to kind of get real with who you are. And it's not that you need to change yourself. It's just recognizing where you can really shine. I've seen so many people spend hundreds and hundreds and thousands of hours trying to take a weakness and turn it into a strength instead of aligning themselves or working with somebody that has that. So know yourself values, you know, pick your values, whatever they may be, um, and stick with them, live them, you know, promote them in your business. I think a business without values today is a business that will get lost and that'll you know, that'll get run over very quickly. Young people today want to work for companies that have a purpose, that have an impact. And I think, you know, we should, as leaders, encourage that. It's fine to make a profit. I think it's very healthy and it's very important. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a capitalist. There's a concept of conscious capitalism. So you can do, you can build a business that's highly profitable without ignoring values and respect for people. Um, and the other, the third one is being super clear, um, on who we lead as leaders. What does that mean? It means really, truly understanding who we lead. It's taking your ego, even though it may be your business, you may be the hundred percent owner. You could not do a fraction of what you're accomplishing without other people. So who are you leading, right? You're leading others. You're leading with intention. You're leading you know, your colleagues, your frontline workers, your stakeholders, and, and it's, how do you lead? You got to know what you, what they need in order for you to support them. What resources do they need? What skills do they need? What just simply sitting and listening to them and caring for them and allowing them to have work-life balance. And then the final one, you know, for me is clarity, role clarity. I have found in a lot of organizations that I've been a part of the ones that the three companies that I've started and, and led. Companies that I've worked for, whether it's YPO or, or now CEO coaching, 
really being crystal clear on, on roles and responsibilities for yourself as a leader. Um, and that, that gives clarity to other people, you know, being real clear. What, what, what are you responsible for? What aren't you responsible for? And then creating the conditions for people really to live into their own responsibilities and accountabilities. It's easier said than done because it has to start with you. So cl role clarity is, is critical. And the, the other side of role clarity is I'm not there to get down in, in, oh, woe is me or buying into stories, or I'm there to provide vision. I'm there to provide motivation. I'm there to provide inspiration, calmness, resilience. And, you know, those are the things we learn through trial and error. And I came to that one sort of, you know, towards the, the, the middle sort of, and, and maybe even now in my career is that there's a huge responsibility for, for role clarity, because sometimes you can't be, be all things to all people. And, you know, you've got to be able to lead candidly, but recognize that you're carrying, you're carrying a, a burden, a burden of responsibility, and you can't afford in many instances to throw the towel in. You just can't. And that role clarity is, it, it changes. And I think you have to be really astute to recognize that. Like in my, yeah. my career, Ray, I started and the company was 8 million in revenue. And, you know, we have, you know, we're, we're much, 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 much bigger now. And I have gone from, you know, being really hands-on operator or having almost everybody in the company report to me to now yes. really learning how to lead executives and, and where we're scaling the company, it's going to change again. And so I've struggled and leaders have struggled working for me as I've gone through those role transitions and trying to get really clear yes. on what does that, this next phase actually mean for me? I, it's so different now than it was 15 years ago when I started this journey. And, uh, and that's such a critical thing because it, it, it's a critical know, thing. Yeah. If you don't know and you're changing, how do you expect the people who work for you to be able to understand their roles and how they're changing? And, and again, this is where a coach can come in and yeah. be very helpful, right? Or your peer group can come in because you've not done it before. Like, you know, at each resurrection, each reinvention, you haven't done it before. Yes, you've got all of the experiences, but you haven't done this role before. You've not been in the position where now your company is no longer reliant solely on you. You know, right. it's no longer, now it's Kerry's team. And ideally, they're going to be smarter, better, more skillful in certain areas. And your pride and your satisfaction will come from seeing them grow and shine and then build the next level of succession. I bet you, you know, 10 years from now, your business will look, you know, very different. And who knows, there may be eight businesses. There may be a bunch of different things that, that happen, right? And you may be off to doing, you may be leading the world. Who knows, right? It's accessible to you. Oh yes. Well, I did have uh, I did have aspirations for governor of Colorado and then POTUS. Well, there you go. Class. You'd be brilliant, but... Adam Terry. You would be. <laughs> no, you would be. I've gotten to know you a little bit. You you have you have an extraordinary gift, as do many leaders, in terms of putting yourself out there, delivering authentically, doing what you say you're going to do. Yeah. You know, no BS. That's powerful. We need more leaders like you, and we need more leaders who truly will lead truly will lead. Yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And I agree with you completely. And uh, we won't get into politics here because, oh, boy, no, it makes it real hard <laughs> to be a politician. Um, yeah. But, you know, back, <laughs> but back to that system that you, that you were talking about, right? As, as, as you chunk things out, you take that vision and then you chunk it out to what do I need to do today? Is that what the Make Big Happen system is. Can you just briefly talk about that and maybe share the new book that you're about to launch to help CEOs figure this out? So we've got a great new book coming out called Making Big Happen. It's going to launch in January. And the Make Big Happen system is based on a series of rhythms. So it starts with daily practices, weekly monitoring, a bi-monthly review. There's a monthly reporting series of tools and best practices. Is what we call a quarterly alignment. And the quarterly alignment is making sure that everything you've done in the preceding 90 days is aligned to your major goals. We call them HOTS, um, you know, that you want to accomplish for the year. Then there's your annual planning. And then it's, think of it as a feedback loop. And then there's, there's the fundamentals, the biannual fundamentals. So the system 
is designed so that you it's iterative it builds on on its on itself and it creates a common language for people within the organization to respond to to communicate on um, and then there's a series of there's a series of tools for each of those um, for each of those rhythms so that's the system that CEO coaching delivers now we think of it as a framework it's not don't think of it as you know a to z it truly is adapted to your specific need at a given point in time and it's it's designed to flex off of your ultimate vision your short medium and long term goals and then the coach um, will work with you to make sure that you're focusing on the highest value most important things to achieve your ultimate goals that you want in the year. And then it's a measurement and the accountability. We use, you know, a lot of our clients are clients of EOS and OKRs and scaling up. We're not one of those systems. So think of those as tools and methodologies within a framework. So we adapt to all of those various component pieces and our, you know, our desire is, hey, use what's most effective for your business, the size of your business, the complexity of your business. You're running a 10,000-person company, highly matrixed in multiple global locations. EOS is not going to work for you. Just what? You know, it's a, it's a very, very good system for growing and scaling a small business. But once you get to complexity, how do you manage that? What sorts of tools, what sorts of structures, what sorts of programs and, and vehicles. And this is where, you know, you've got some of the most brilliant consulting companies in the world, like Bain and McKinsey and e and y and all of these great organizations that understand how to help support and manage those giant global enterprises. Our focus is the middle market, the small, medium sized market. So we're not in the early startup phase. We're in that scale phase. We do have some very talented CEOs that have run multi-billion dollar businesses, but we've, we've picked a niche. So when is the book coming out? The book is coming out this month. It's called Making Big Happen, and it's available on Amazon. And I would encourage you all to grab a copy. You will love it. Easy to read, very digestible, and it's also available in audio, I believe. Yes, I know. I have it. I got my advanced copy because I, uh, one of my stories is included in it, so Mark sent me one. Yes, it is. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's exciting to be featured in the book. And I, as working with the framework for multiple years um, and morphing it to my business, I just have to say that it's it's really really helpful. And it's helped me make hard decisions. It's helped me take advantage of opportunities, and it's helped me communicate a lot better with my team and with my company because of the shared language. So it's uh, it's a great framework. I'm a believer, that's for sure. <laughs> Thank you, Kerry. That is so so appreciated. And yeah, I've, you know, there's some great exa- the great exercises in the book. And if you just yeah. do one, do your crystal ball. Yeah. Sit down and just go through what we call the crystal ball exercise, which is. Get clear on what you want. Get clear on what opportunities you're struggling with, you know, what's standing in your way. And then, you know, hold yourself accountable to your own productivity. And if you just do that one exercise, I guarantee you that you'll come away with some ahas that go, wow, this is giving me a framework and, you know, some priorities to work on. And then we're here to help you if you need our help. That's wonderful. Wonderful. All right. To wrap things up, I have two final questions. So the name of this podcast is Reflect Forward, and I would like to know what does Reflect Forward mean to you? What a beautiful name of the podcast, firstly. So for me, you we can't design ourselves and our lives without designing from the future. We must live in the present, but in order to be fully functional, we've got to have a goal. We've got to have something out there in all aspects of our life, whether it be business, personal relationship, enjoyment, whatever that may be. So start with putting an anchor out and it doesn't have to be 50 years out, make it a year out, make it two years out, reflect forward because that'll guide you and it'll help you really get clear on what it, uh, what it's going to take, you know, to get you to the point that you're going to be satisfied and happy and fulfilled. Yes. There you go. (laughs) Good. All good things. Good. Great answer. Thank you. 
All right. And then finally, uh, what is your best piece of advice for leaders who are looking to be exceptional at what they do? Be intentional about your leadership. So if I go back to my four, be intentional about knowing yourself, picking and staying true to your values, being super clear on who you serve and why you're serving them, and be clear about your role as a leader. You do those four in a very intentional way and you check yourself daily, weekly, monthly, and with people that you trust. I think you'll have a spectacular life. I love it. <laughs> so inspiring. <laughs> oh, all right. And how can people find you? How can people find CEO Coaching International? Where should they go? So we're at ceocoaching.com and you can find me at Sean McGinnis, S-E-A-N-M-A-G-E-N-N-I-S -N -N at ceocoaching.com. Sean McGinnis at ceocoaching.com. You can find me on LinkedIn. Sean McGinnis, it's a great, um, it's a great way to connect with me and I'm happy to connect with any of your listeners. And you post great stuff. I, I always like your content. Uh, so I'm a, I'm an avid follower you. of you as well. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. Likewise. <laughs> Wonderful. And I'll include all of those in the show notes as well. Well, Sean, it has been such a pleasure to interview you. you and get to know you a little bit better. And I'm thrilled you're part of the CEO Coaching International team. I can't wait to uh, to see you in person again. And and going to come fairly soon. Hopefully, right? we'll see each other in, in in the next few weeks. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. All right. Well, we'll wrap things up. Hang tight, everybody, and I'll be right back. All right, everyone, I am back. I hope you enjoyed that interview. Sean is such an amazing leader, He's done so many cool things and, uh, and really inspiring. And I love his, his, uh, his four pillars of, of leadership, of really understanding uh, your leadership style. I think that's really great advice. All right, with that, I will leave you until next week where we will have another episode of Advice from a CEO and Reflect Forward. I hope you have a fantastic day and thanks again for listening. Take care. Bye.